Hey, everybody. My guest today is Dr. Philip Reed, and we're going to talk about discrimination against the dying in the context of medical resource allocation. All right, Philip, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Philip Reed. I am a professor of philosophy at Canisius University, where I've been for more than a dozen years. And I work um, in ethics, uh, history of philosophy, and also in some applied ethics, especially biomedical ethics, which is what our paper is about for today. No, thank you for that. So you wrote a paper about discrimination against the dying, and I was hoping that you could summarize the argument in the paper. Sure, we're happy to do so. The argument is really just to put forward um, a what I think of as a kind of novel kind of discrimination that has not been recognized or well recognized uh, by bioethicists and policymakers, and that is discrimination against the dying, um, which I call in the paper terminalism. Uh, because I take the dying to be people who are suffering from a terminal illness. And typically in medical contexts, we define a terminal illness as having a prognosis of maybe six months uh, or so or, uh, left to live. And so the idea is if you have such a prognosis, then you are dying, uh, in my view. And if there is treatment that you're experiencing, um, that is worse than you would expect to receive if you weren't dying, then you are suffering from discrimination. So philosophers and social theorists who work on discrimination typically say that in order to be a subject of discrimination, you have to be in a social, socially salient group, which means that you're the membership of a certain group, uh, structures a wide range of social contexts, um, structures sort of choices that people make as members of that group. And so I put forward this idea that people who are dying are in such a group um, because the fact that they're dying affects the way that they make choices in a, in a wide variety of social contexts. Uh, so for example, you know, you might say that if you're dying, you might rearrange your schedule to go on vacation instead of do other things that you would do if you weren't dying. So that's an indication that you're structuring your, your choices around uh, the fact that you're a membership of this group. And therefore, I think that you can be subject to discrimination. And I, um, in the paper, I identify four examples of this kind of terminalism um, in order to explain it a little bit more and, and sort of delve into what I take this kind of discrimination to be. Um, and these are just important to mention as part of the summary, I think. I talk about eligibility requirements for receiving hospice care in the U.S. Um, and those requirements include this idea that you have to give up curative treatments, so treatments aimed at curing your underlying disease. You're not allowed to receive those treatments if you um, are eligible for hospice care in the U.S. And I take that to be discrimination because these treatments can be beneficial to patients, uh, even if they're not expected to be completely cured of their illness. So that's one kind of discrimination. The second um, one is that I discuss is allocation of scarce medical resources. And this example we saw most prominently recently in the pandemic, where ventilators and other scarce resources were restricted uh, from patients who were dying on account of their dying. So they didn't receive treatments that could be beneficial, that could be effective because they weren't expected to live long. And so we wanted to sort of allocate those to um, people who could benefit more. Uh, that's the second example. The third example is what, what are called right to try laws. So if you have a terminal illness, uh, recently we passed in the US legislation in a bunch of states and then later federal legislation that said um, that you can be, if you have a terminal illness, you can be eligible to uh, try sort of risky experimental treatments um, just because you're in a desperate situation. And uh, these are treatments that aren't approved by the FDA. So there's a real question about whether they're safe and certainly about whether they're effective. And yet um, terminally ill individuals can receive these treatments. And in doing so, they get exposed to um, unnecessary risks that I think make them subjects, again, of discrimination. The fourth example and last one is right to right to die, sometimes called right to die laws or assisted suicide or aid in dying. And the idea here is that at least in the US where we restricted assisted suicide to uh, patients who are terminally ill, we are subjecting them to a kind of discrimination insofar as we're saying to them, 
that um, they have a serious problem that death can solve for them. So the idea that um, that you know their life is no longer worth living, that death can be a benefit to them, is a way to devalue and degrade uh, terminally ill persons, and so hence a way of subjecting them to discrimination. So I could say more about any of those that you want, but those are the examples. In the final part of the paper, I distinguish um, terminalism from related and adjacent kinds of discrimination. So I do say that I think terminalism is related to both discrimination that we're more familiar with, namely ageism or discrimination against the old, and then ableism or discrimination against the disabled. And I think that terminalism does overlap with those two, but that it's unique, distinct. Um, there can be cases where someone is terminally ill and not old, as well as not officially disabled. And for that reason, um, we should pay attention to the distinctness of terminalism in, in understanding what kinds of discrimination we are subjecting people to. Thank you for that. So there, there is a lot there in this paper. So let's kind of... Um... Let's kind of like break it down like one by one. So the first thing that you talked about was social group membership, right? And I've you know I've heard that term used before as well. And as far as I remember, uh, in order to be a social group, there's some sort of like in group membership recognition, and there's like out group membership recognition. It's kind of like there there are people who belong in this group, and the people in the group know that other people belong in this group, and they and those people know collectively like who does not belong in this group let's say that we grant that that they are a social group do you think that it, it's necessarily wrong to discriminate them then because that they are a social group like is that is what's doing the work like what if they weren't a social group would then therefore not be wrong um well if they weren't a social group then um i'm not sure it would count as discrimination i mean they may they may be subject to ill treatment but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be discrimination in that sense i mean I don't, wouldn't want to say that I'm an expert in any sense on this literature, but m but my sense is that if you weren't, um, if you didn't have membership of a certain group, but you faced certain kinds of poor treatment, that wouldn't count as discrimination. That the group membership, in a certain way, is necessary for uh, discrimination. So if we think about you know analogs such as racism, sexism, etc., all instances of discrimination, group membership is necessary in order to be a victim of discrimination. Um, now, you asked about wrongness, and I do talk in the paper about how I don't take, in my view, I don't take discrimination to be necessarily moralized. So I don't think discrimination is, uh, as a conceptual matter, something that's conducting a moral wrong. That leaves open the possibility for justified discrimination. Uh, so I do think there are cases where um, the prima facie wrongness of discrimination are outweighed uh, by other moral considerations and where therefore the discrimination could be justified. One kind of example people give in this context is sort of affirmative action, which some people think is clearly a kind of discrimination, um, which seems right to me, but maybe you know you could argue that it's justified uh, for various reasons, nevertheless, even though it is discrimination. So uh, it seems right to me to call that discrimination, but maybe it's not a, a morally wrong kind of discrimination. And just if I can say real quick to to follow up on that, um, in the paper I do say that I'm inclined to think, um, and I don't sort of flesh this out in the paper, but I'm inclined to think that the discrimination that happens with scarce medical resources against the terminally ill is a justified kind of discrimination. So. Um, there are sufficiently moral reasons for us to restrict eligibility for scarce resources in a pandemic uh, to uh, for, from individuals who are terminally ill. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important to call that discrimination because that's what that's what it is. Yeah, I think that's a good point. That discrimination is unavoidable if you have to prioritize some people over others because there's just simply not enough medical resources, right? But the, the question is not whether or not it's discrimination, whether whether or not you can do it, right? The question is whether or not it's justified, right? Yeah. Because you can do it in a way that is wrong, but uh, but you can do you can also do it in a way that that is defensible, right? So then we're just trying to figure out which properties that are relevant that could justify prioritizing one patient over another patient. Yeah, although I mean, that seems right to me, um, but some people do disagree with that. And you know, I, I do think there's a connotation of discrimination where we assume like if, to call something discrimination, we it seems as if we may be saying, 
oh, this could be, this is morally wrong. And, you know, there's a negative connotation that the term discrimination has. So to talk about justified discrimination does sound to some ears, um, you know, the wrong way to approach this issue. And so for them, I think they build in th this idea that discrimination has to be wrong. Um, and so probably what they would say is the cases where w what you and I would describe as justified discrimination is um, is not discrimination at all. They would use some other you know term, I think. And you know we'd have to look at those um, theories in more detail to sort of see um, you know where where uh, we might disagree on on how those get played out. But I do admit that I think discrimination has a negative connotation. Yeah, I agree as well. I mean, normally when we use it, we mean it in a negative way, right? Perhaps the the, the positive or the morally permissible analog is differentiate, right? Differentiate might be a better yeah, right? Differentiate. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah. I take that to just be what discrimination in a sense is, you know, uh, choosing one thing rather than another thing, right? right. There, we yeah. have no sort of uh, moral concepts involved in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I gather is that you do think that it is justifiable sometimes, but sometimes it's not justifiable. So let's start in the, in the case of the justifiable one, uh, which is the uh, allocation of scarce medical resources. Can you explain to me why you think that is justified? To just to discriminate against the dying, right? So I don't have a sort of worked out answer to this, but I mean, I'll just give the kind of obvious one that people say, and you you know uh, that that seems pretty clear when you, when you think about the issue, which is that if you only you know have one ventilator, say, and there are you know two people, one of them whom is dying, one whom is not. It just seems like an inefficient use of resources to give the ventilator to the person who is dying. It, it seems wrong to not use the ventilator at all. Um, it seems kind of mindless to flip a coin or you know have them you know uh, pull a, pull straws or whatever, uh, engage in a lottery type system. That seems kind of ridiculous and not a, a, a very prudent way of using a resource. Um, and so it seems like it's relevant to take into account the fact that someone is not likely to live much longer. So I would give it to the person who who wasn't dying. And, and if I were dying, I would expect um, to understand. I would hope that I could understand why the non-dying person would get it. Um, at the same time, though, I, I think, as I mentioned in uh, response to another question, I think that there's um, a kind of moral psychology that might be appropriate in that circumstance when we withhold scarce resources from the dying that might include, you know, appropriate moral attitudes. So uh, perhaps some kind of under understanding that that um, we're, you know, harming the person who's dying because they're not receiving treatment they would receive uh, if the the resource weren't scarce. You know, so we would be harming them, and so maybe. Um, you know, a, a sense of guilt, a sense of responsibility, um, sorrow, remorse, you know, asking for forgiveness or repentance. I mean, these are things that might be appropriate when we have to turn away dying people from resources that are scarce in, in an emergency situation. Um, so that's the, the short answer. Uh, obviously, there's a large literature on that issue as well. Yeah, at the core of it, it just seems to be a utilitarian justification. Right, like we're just not going to maximize benefits if you're going to give the ventilator to somebody who's going to die anyway. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you want to you want to try to max maximize benefits in certain situations. I, I mean, that I myself am not a utilitarian, but I think there are cases where um, you know maximizing maximizing benefits is appropriate, minimizing harms is appropriate, and this is one such case. Yeah, I'm not a utilitarian either. I'm not actually sure what I am. <laughs> um, it's, I'm still working through it. You know, it's, a, it, it's, sure. it's, you know, it's tough, right? It's tough. It's sometimes I do see the truth in utilitarianism and this is one of those cases at the same time, it seems quite intuitive to most people, right? So I, I'm not alone in this and we're not alone in this. Yeah. I mean, uh, in the, you know, in, in the pandemic, you know, there was pretty strong consensus when we sort of looked at ethicists sort of talking about how to distribute these resources. There was a pretty strong consensus in favor of, you know, certain kinds of protocols. I mean, some got controversial when when um, we were doing things like maybe discriminating uh, against the disabled people who aren't dying, but who were really sick. And there were some protocols that sort of edged in that direction that got controversial. But, you know, for the most part, we agreed that, you know, and it seems like pretty intuitive that, that um, you know, terminally ill people, there may be reasons to restrict access to certain medical care if uh, you know, if, if the person is not 
expected to live much longer, even with the benefit of the care. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So let's take another example, but one in which you think discrimination against the dying is morally impermissible. Right. Was there what? Did you want me to? Yeah. I think the first one that you mentioned. I did say that, that the first, I do say in the paper, the first one I think is impermissible. Yeah. Right. And I just think that the problem there is that we don't have a sufficiently good reason uh, to restrict terminally ill patients from curative treatments um, if they're going to be receiving hospice care. So the idea is roughly that we're subjecting them to worse treatment without an adequately good reason. What is the reason that we do it? Well, it's principally to kind of cut down costs. And it has a certain logic to it because we say, given that the person is terminally ill, there's no point in them receiving curative treatments because they're not expected to be cured of their underlying illness. That's correct. But nevertheless, there are benefits involved in certain kinds of uh, treatments that might have as their principal aim uh, to sort of cure the, the underlying disease, but nevertheless um, can benefit a patient in various ways. Patients can receive palliative uh, treatments or effects from um, what are intended to be primarily curative uh, treatments in nature. And that seems to me the fact that we say you can't have those treatments if you want to receive hospice care uh, on the basis of a cost-saving measure seems to me morally impermissible because the reason doesn't outweigh the harm that's done by the terminalist practice. All right, let's go to the uh, the other examples. What was the third example again that you mentioned? The right, right to, try. to try. Yeah, right to try laws. Yeah. So in this one, um, and again, I mean, the right right to try laws are a kind of new thing where um, legislators just got this idea that terminally ill patients were really wanting try, to try to receive experimental treatments that they weren't otherwise getting. And so it was popular um, with leg this, these laws were popular with legislators because it looked as if, in my view, it looked as if um, the legislators were fighting the medical establishment, you know, big pharma and, you know, the FDA and these kinds of evil medical health care companies that were greedy and wanting to, um, you know, impose all kinds of uh, restrictions in, uh, on, on patients in ways that were perhaps beneficial to their bottom line. And legislators pushed these because they thought, look, we could allow terminally ill patients to access treatments that we don't know work. And um, if they're dying, then they don't um, need to be concerned about whether they're effective or safe. They're willing to take on more risks. So um, I, you know, the medical establishment, though, has generally been against them because for a couple of reasons. One is that there's already uh, a, there was already a process in place for terminally ill patients to receive treatments that were uh, enabled the patient to take on more risks and weren't yet approved. Um, and this was a, a policy called expanded access. So it was already the case that terminally ill patients were um, able to access treatments that weren't available, okay? Um, but the issue with the right to try laws is that there is no um, process for governing the safety and effectiveness of the treatments that are now expected to, um, that patients can can sort of demand more or less. They can just say, I want this kind of treatment, um, you know, regardless of whether it's been approved by any medical official in any capacity. And in, uh, from what I've read, in certain cases, these patients are often on the hook for paying for these treatments. So not only do they have to put the bill for the, for the treatment, there's no um, process for ensuring that these won't put them in a worse position that they would receive if they weren't undergoing these treatments. And that seems to me to be an unjustified case of, of terminalism or discrimination. We're subjecting them to more harms than they would otherwise um, get. And, you know, one way to see the the discrimination is to change the eligibility to another socially salient group. So if we said that, you know, um, black people, for instance, were allowed to experiment with unapproved medical treatments, well, it seems clear in that case that we would say we were discriminating against such people because we're not overseeing the safety and effectiveness of the treatments that black people would be eligible for. So by doing this for terminally ill people, it's the same thing in terms of discrimination. So I do think that I'm worried about that kind of um, discrimination. I see. No, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm not sure if I see the analog between those two groups, though, because the people who are dying, I mean, they 
you know, I, I suspect that they're very desperate to have to, <laughs> you know, to go through that process, right? It's just like, I'm, I don't want to die, you know, like I'm willing to try anything if, if it right. can help me, you know? Right. Whereas, you know, that doesn't really apply to any other group. Like no, like by definition, no other group is dying. So I don't want to say that any kind of differential treatment to go back to a phrase that you, a uh, helpful phrase you used earlier. Um, I don't want to say that any kind of differential treatment for the terminally ill is counts as discrimination. Okay. So for example, um, if a patient has end stage renal disease, it may be appropriate to withdraw or withhold uh, dialysis for such a patient. And we would do that, I would think, in cases where the dialysis is not expected to benefit the patient. So now we might not do that if the patient weren't dying, okay? Um, so does that count as discrimination? I don't think so, because, because of the fact that withholding the dialysis from such a patient doesn't make the patient worse off, okay? so. It's not really uh, discrimination in that sense, even though it's differential treatment. Um, it's not discrimination because it doesn't make the patient worth, worse off, let's hypothesize. And so that's what I'm concerned about with um, right to try laws. You're right that the rationale for these laws provided makes sense for the dying in a way that it doesn't for, say, other social groups. But the, the matter of whether it makes the patients worse off, I think, is an empirical one. And that's sort of where I come down against these laws in the sense that, yes, a patient is desperate and may be more willing to try certain things. But if the things that they're willing to try are not going, in fact, are not um, treated in such a way that, that, that are designed to uh, protect the patient, then, in fact, it's going to make them worse off than they would have been if they didn't um, try those treatments. And the unique situation of being dying, as I mentioned, was already taken into account with this idea of expanded access. So as long as we can allow patients to be more, you know, willing to try things to try uh, to to um, address their desperation, their sense of like wanting to, you know, roll the dice with anything whatsoever in ways that won't harm them, which I think is expanded access did, then I'm okay with it. That kind of differential treatment is not discrimination. But what these laws do, again, medical providers are very unanimous in being against these laws. Uh, the, what the laws do is they say, we're going to give you treatments that we, we, that can't in any way um, guarantee your sort of protect your interests and, and that can be seen to benefit you. And so that means that these patients are put in a worse position than they would be if they didn't have access to them. So that's where I think there's a difference. I think you're right. It is an empirical question, right? Like, yeah. do these treatments actually help patients or not? Like on the whole, on average, are they beneficial or not? And you're saying that according to the data, empirically, on average, they are not beneficial? Well, I mean, I, you know, I think that well, that's what the medical community is, is saying overall, right? So, I mean, I'm not a physician and I'm not an expert on the data. Uh, of course, we don't have, these laws are pretty new, so we don't have a ton of data on how, you know, beneficial these treatments are. But, you know, the medical community has almost unanimously said these kinds of treatments that the laws are intended to provide will be an on net harmful to patients. So um, I'd have to just, you know, wave my hands a bit here and, and, and tell you that this seems to be the, the conclusion of most, most medical experts. Okay. No, that's helpful. There are some studies, I mean, that I cite in the paper that, you know, you, where, where people could read more about this. But um, Okay. So it, for this particular issue, it seems like that there are two components, okay? So one component is just the patient being willing to do anything and everything to not die, right? Yeah. The other component is the medical establishment enabling them to do that, right? Right. So let's say if we were to get rid of that second component, let's say the medical establishment is not even uh, relevant in a particular case, right? Let's say you have a person who is dying, they know that they're dying and they don't want to die. And they're willing to do any, you know, anything, right? They're willing to take whatever supplement that they can find, all, like online or read about on the internet. Maybe they start growing some special plants, medicinal plants, yeah. to to ingest, right? Would you say that that is morally impermissible? Well, I mean, the issue there is like they're if they're doing things that are legal and of their own free will, 
I don't think that's morally impermissible. But I, I would do worry about um, um, allowing do- getting doctors involved and, and forcing doctors right in the medical community to to give access to treatments. Um, I mean, this is what has this happened in some of these cases, to my understanding, is like, you know, doctors are saying this treatment will not benefit you. You know, it has no chance of benefiting you. But they think for for whatever reason that it will benefit them. And then so the doctors are, are forced to provide the treatment. Um, it's kind of, you know, gets into complex matters um, that I'm sure you you discuss with your uh, pharmacy students, you know, that have to do with the sort of nature of the doctor-patient relationship and the way that medicine has kind of become a consumerist uh, kind of practice where doctors are sort of work similarly to, you know, the way a car mechanic or contractor might just, you know, comply with the wishes of, of their clients, um, of their customers. Um, and medicine has kind of moved in that direction, right? And this is another extreme version of that where patients are saying to doctors, this is what I want, and you need to give it to me, right? And um, doctors, you know, have in some cases have to do that even though they think it's bad for the patient. And that's what I'm concerned about, right? I'm concerned about that kind of force providing of care rather than restricting access to whatever kind of crazy, you know, treatments that, that terminally ill people think that might benefit them. Yeah. So that's why I suspected, right? Like if we were just talking about a private citizen, that's that's not really the problem. The issue is that the medical establishment is involved and that they would be enabling this person to, you know, try anything and everything, right? And, you know, like, of course, like one of the principles of biomedical ethics is, you know, beneficence and non-maleficence. So there's that element there, right? Like you're not supposed to uh, provide a particular medication or treatment to a patient uh, who's not going to benefit from it and who may even suffer from it, right? Even if they won't. So, yeah, I mean, you might compare it to like people, you know, trying ivermectin in the COVID-19 pandemic or something, right? I mean, it should be the case that a physician, if you go to a physician and say, prescribe me some ivermectin, you know, physician shouldn't be required to give you that um, if the physician thinks, as I think most do, that there's going to be no benefit to you uh, from taking that. And you might be subjected to real risks. So that would be a violation of non-maleficence. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we can just address this issue by enforcing and protecting conscientious objection laws, right? Like you, like, let's say that you were a physician and you know, this person is asking for, you know, colloidal silver or something like that. And you think that's not going to be beneficial. So you're not going to be forced to, to provide it. I mean, I think that would probably, um, I think that would probably work yeah, to solve uh, the same, the concern that I have about it. Off the top of my head, I can't see any problem with that. But I mean, if, if you have, if you pass these laws, as we've done, then there might be a conflict there with, I mean, and maybe that's something that would have to get worked out in the courts, Jason, I don't know, but there could be, if you say, you know, terminally ill patients have a right to try experimental treatment according to these laws that are on the books in the U.S., and then you also say there's strong conscientious protection, uh, protection for providers to decide whether or not they're going to give care, then there might be a potential problem where, you know, those come into conflict. Um, but I think the laws themselves, as they stand, and this is my concern in the paper, are discriminatory. So um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways to, you know, get around the kind of concern involved. And I think conscientious objection is, uh, is a good way to do it. So I think this is a good segue to the fourth example that you used, uh, and it was a right to die, right? So why don't you, uh, yeah. can you expand on that? Sure. Um so the idea here, and this is controversial, right? Because these uh, this controversial practice, but the idea here is that um, there are different ways that you can go about legalizing suicide or euthanasia. Okay, and, and one is that you can just say that um, you know it could be available to anyone who wanted it. Okay, now, no, we haven't done that in any place, any jurisdiction so far. But that's one method, right? You could just say that uh, the right to die is a right that everybody has. You know. And if you did it that way, you wouldn't actually be discriminating against anyone by offering people a right to die um, because everyone would be treated the same. But as soon as you introduce a restriction for who can access assisted suicide or euthanasia, then you're, I think, running into a problem of, of discrimination because you're saying that this group of people we can understand your reasons for wanting to die and we can help you get there right we can either provide you with assistance on how to kill yourself or we can kill you um 
directly as doctors do, as you know, in Canada and the Netherlands and Belgium. So once you restrict eligibility to a certain group of people, then you're facing problems of discrimination. In Canada, what you saw was it was originally uh, made, was originally restricted to people who whose death was reasonably foreseeable. And it has since expanded beyond that. It's dropped that requirement now. So now, nevertheless, you do have to have a severe condition, you know, a, um, a, a condition of what's described as irremediable suffering. And, you know, the, that whole system in Canada is still getting worked out. But there's a question there of whether they're discriminating against another group of individuals, perhaps the disabled. Canada right now is in the process of extending euthanasia to, um, to eligibility to those who are mentally ill. So then, you know, if you're saying that you can access euthanasia if you have a severe mental illness, is that discrimination against people who are mentally ill? Okay, so anytime you restrict eligibility, you run into this problem of discrimination. In the US, there are um, a number of states that have legalized assisted suicide. All of them say you have to have a terminal illness. So in, in every state, um, it is restricted to people who are terminally ill. And that's um, what I think of as terminalism, because the idea is that um, terminally ill people are being subject to a form of discrimination insofar as they're being extended a treatment that is designed to kill them to solve their problems. So that I take to be um, devaluing those that group of individuals. Like, think about it this way. Even if you didn't want assisted suicide, Nevertheless, if you're terminally ill and you live in California, you're eligible for it. Well, that might be taken as a way of, you know, undermining your value, you know, undermining your um, sense of worth, your respect. The idea is like in dying, you are subject to an indignified process. And so if you want to avoid that process, you can kill yourself um, to get it over with more quickly. And that seems to be a way of discriminating against people. Another way, and, and, and I'm worried about that um, as well, though I recognize that you know other people have reasons in support of, of these kinds of laws. But um, another way to see the discrimination too is to think about the matter um, of whether one will receive suicide assistance or suicide prevention. So you know if you are struggling from depression, uh, but you're not dying and you tell someone, I want to die, I want to end my life. Well, you're going to receive in every state in this country aggressive measures to try to prevent you from committing suicide. You know, um, we're going to sort of give you therapy. We're going to try to help you access support and resources that you need to make you want to live longer. But if you're terminally ill and you say, I want to end my life, then you don't receive those uh, suicide prevention resources. Instead, we say to you, well, you know, we can help you die by giving you a prescription for a lethal drug. So that, that that's a differential treatment, right? It's a differential treatment for the terminally ill. Um, and it's problematic in my view, because it, it devalues the lives of people who are terminally ill by saying, we understand uh, your reasons for wanting to die and we'll help you do it. So that's the concern with that one. Okay. Thank you for that. So <laughs> At first, I wasn't entirely sure what you meant by discrimination against the dying in that context. I was wondering whether or not you thought we were treating, you know, terminally ill patients worse in this case, or we were treating non-terminally ill patients worse in this way. Because I've actually heard the opposite argument, right? Like, oh, like yeah. if terminally ill patients have access to this treatment or procedure, then everyone else should. Like, how come? How come? Like, yeah. I shouldn't have access to it. You know, <laughs> it's almost like the treatment. Well, that is, yeah. I mean, that is everything. the point. That's a point that supporters make, right? Is that in and restricting it to the terminally ill, we're discriminating against the non-dying, you know, because we're preventing the non-dying from accessing a real benefit. Okay. Yes. Um, so you're right that the point is made in the other direction as well, and it may be difficult to get around the question of whether, you know, in providing assisted dying, we're providing a benefit or not. Okay. So yes. Right. Yes. I think that's what it comes down to. Right. Um, and what, if you don't address that and don't answer that question, then I feel like that you could point the discrimination charge uh, either way. I think that's fair. But again, I mean, I would want to say, you know, there are still, I mean, I would want to say that there are reasons to, to, to point it in one way or the other. Um, and I also reference, you know, in the article, the the point that's made by Velleman, which you must know about, um, where he talks, you know, about how 
in so far as giving people the choice to take their own lives, we are forcing them to justify their existence in a way that we wouldn't if we don't give them the choice. Um, and so if we do that for the terminally ill, it's another sort of avenue to see that they're being discriminated against because, you know, you, you can say, oh, well, if you're terminally ill, you don't have to partake in assistance in dying, right? You can live as long as you want and die naturally. Um, that's true. But then, of course, you might feel the need to justify your decision uh, to do that. You know, you might have to tell yourself, I'm willing to be a burden on my family for a bit longer and, and not taking the lethal medication. Um, and that seems a bit unfair. You know, it, feel, it, it feels discriminatory to me to tell people that they are in a position where they have to defend wanting to live, which is something that we don't subject regular people to. But I mean, again, even with that one, yes, you know, you'll probably come down to the issue. Is it a benefit to these people or not? And it's not something I can solve, you know, in this paper, of course. Yeah. So the, I can see a legitimate debate over the terminally ill requirement mm -hmm. to uh, be eligible for something like MAID. And I mean, on the one hand, it's like, okay, like we don't want people to die, right? In general, we don't want people to die. We don't want people to take their own life. We don't want doctors to kill their patients, right? I think all of us can agree on that. That is the general the general feeling, okay? But insofar that it can be a benefit for some patients in some circumstances to die, we mm -hmm. need to make sure that that's the last resort. Sure. So, but I mean, couldn't you do that in a way that wasn't terminalist? So um, instead of just saying, you know, everyone who's terminally ill is eligible, right? You could say, you know, this could be uh, available to people in any situation, right? But only as a last resort, um, and then it wouldn't be then it wouldn't be terminalist if you did it that yeah. way. Yeah, you know? no, and I agree. And that's like the other side of the debate, right? Like I can see that as well because maybe you don't have a deter a terminal illness. Like l let's say you're suffering from a psychiatric condition, right? But it's causing you immense suffering. And it seems to be incurable, right? Maybe you've tried everything. You've tried. You've seen multiple doctors, and nothing has cured you, right? Um, in those cases, I, I can I can see how something like made is justifiable as well. Um, but I will say that there are some people who think that you know everyone should have the right to die, you know, regardless of whether it's a last resort. Um, and people like Thomas, I don't know how to say his name, Saz, um, S S Z A S D or something. He's a, he was actually a psychologist in upstate New York. Um, and others have said, you know, philosophers have said this as well. We don't really want to restrict access to assistance in dying to just anyone. That really, it's a, it's a fundamental right. And, you know, there are some people that think that, that um, we don't need to avoid people, to, people dying. So there is that view out there, though it's, you're right that it's not popular. Yeah, I, don't, I definitely don't hold that view. This kind of parallels the, uh, the part of the discussion that we had earlier, which is there's the individual action part, and then there's the medical establishment participating part, right? So yeah. maybe you want to say, well, you do have a right to take your own life, yeah, 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 because it's your life, it's your body, right? right? But right. then it, that doesn't mean that a, a, you know you have the right to you know a doctor helping you. Yeah, although you know, and some people have advocated for that. We make euthanasia separate from the medical community. Maybe you get like a special group of nurses, or you know, maybe um, you get—I don't know—you train people to do this right um, separately from from the way the re the rest of medicine is practiced. And even if you did it that way, right? If you restricted eligibility to the terminally ill with your laws, that's still terminalist. So even if you did it outside of medicine, um, but you're absolutely right that there's a special concern for medical doctors um, to you know provide this. Thing which may not be a medical treatment, right? Because it's not um, it's not aiming to cure or palliate the patient, right? It's actually a pathology, right? You're you're killing the patient, so that's a real concern, um, and 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 also a reason to go back to the I think your previous point about conscientious conscientious objection, right? So that providers who don't want to give it um, shouldn't have to. And that seems right to me. Yeah. So in terms of the right to die, then do you think that the approach is just to restrict it from everybody or to what like uh, I how would you that yes because I'm against so I am against um assisted suicide and euthanasia and would restrict it would restrict it from everybody right so, but it, it are you against it because it, it discriminates against the dying um well that's only one one reason that's only one reason right because again I mean you could do it without discriminating against the dying okay so, and, but and I would you'd still be against it 
And I'd still be against it, right? So I think that it is not, you know, understanding as a benefit is mistaken, you know? And so that would be where I'd have to debate, you know, the supporter on that point. Um, yeah. So, and that would be, that would be the subject of another conversation. That would be the subject of another conversation. Correct. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's a good place to wrap things up. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Really nice to talk with you, Jason, about this issue. And I appreciate you taking the time to do it.